Okay, so before we get to the Gemara, I just want to add and clarify from yesterday. We're talking about the Pasuk says that after Yosef died, there's a new king that arose. We're on Yudalaf and by the way, we're on 11a. So the, the Gemara quoted the Pasuk, a new king arose on Egypt that should not know Yosef. And we're discussing the Gemara has two opinions here one that says literally a new king, and the other one that says not a new king, but he renewed his decrees. He started acting differently, he started to make new decrees. And we had shared that the Rebbe talks about disputes between Rav and Shmuel. One of, the, one of them is this one. And we gave another example, though now that I looked it up over here, there's like, here it gives here, I think, four different examples. Maybe more, uh, one, two, three, four. This is Lakutli Sikhas. This is um, um, four, 39 volumes of talks that I gave that have been edited. And there's hundreds of books, transcripts of their talks, but then certain talks were taken, turned into essays, they've edited them and then published them. And that became 39 volumes of Lakutli Sikhas. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a monumental amount of content. They're still not finished publishing all the Rebbe's teachings, just to give you an idea. It's, it's actually monumental in terms of just the amount of content, just literally the amount of content that, that has been produced. I think it's been partly translated in English. So some of it's in English. Yeah, we have it in the library here, some in English. Anyway, so um, the two examples we gave was the Ma'aras and Machpelah, the dispute on the, the cave of the patriarchs, and this Gemara here, Rayaka Malachadash, where a new king arose, which by the way is also quoted in the Gemara there in Erevin, not just here. Okay, so we said as follows. The one who says literally new king is highlighting the actual word itself. The word is new king, it's a new king. And the one who says that's not a new king, but the new king started behaving differently and started acting with new decrees, is not looking at the literal word, but rather at the content or context. And the reason he says that is because the Gemara points out because the verse doesn't say, and the king died and a new king replaced him, which is ordinarily what the verse would say when there's a new king. Usually you would say, there was a king died and replaced. The verse does not say that. Therefore it says, not a literal new king, but kind of, uh, what's the word like, not metaphorical, but like, um, Figuratively, that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Figuratively, a new king, because he completely renewed the way he, his attitude, but the Schachik Zerusim started behaving differently. So I, I missed the detail in the content versus the literal meaning. So the one who says it's a new king, okay, it's a literal meaning, is a new king, finished, new king. And, the re, and, and this would mean that why is the verse mentioning it as a new king now? Because the verse is about to start talking about how cruel Pharaoh is to the Jewish people. Now, how could the Pharaoh be cruel to the people who saved his country. A couple of years earlier, Yosef and the people, Yosef and Yaakov and his family saved Pharaoh. And the verse needs to address this, like turn coat all of a sudden, which is what the verse says, there's a new king. So the literal meaning of the answer to the question of how there was such a shift in Egyptian attitude is because there's a new king who didn't know Yosef or acted like he didn't know Yosef. But it's a new king, sorry? Right, so when the verse says he didn't know Yosef, it doesn't mean he did, the Gemara actually says this, it doesn't mean he did, actually didn't know Yosef. It means he acted as if he didn't know Yosef. He didn't like yeah, he acted as if he didn't know Yosef, but it would make sense. In other words, the literal, even if you have to take the fact that he didn't know Yosef, not literally, and that he's acting as if he didn't know Yosef, the fact that we say literally there's a new king is a better literal answer to why there's a shift in Egyptian attitude. The old king liked Yosef, it was his viceroy, and then when a new king arrives, even though he knew who Yosef was, because he knows the history, he made as if he didn't know Yosef because it's a new king, new attitude, new reign, we don't like the Jews. And that explains why there's a change in attitude. So now the king liked the Jewish people, new king arrives, and the guy doesn't like the Jewish people. And this has happened throughout history, who knows how many times. Every time a king died, in whatever country, the Jews were always worried. What's the new king gonna be like? Is he gonna like the Jews or not like the Jews? And it very often happened like this, where you had a king who had advisors who were Jewish, the guy dies, new kings arise, fires all the Jewish advisors, fires them in the best case scenario, in other cases, ends their lives, and then new attitude, you don't like the Jews anymore. 
So that's one way of answering the, the simple question that, that the reader of the Chumash has. Why a shift in attitude? They like the Jews now, all of a sudden they don't like the Jews. Answer, new king. And this new king acted as if he doesn't, like, doesn't know Yosef. That would be taking the literal meaning. Right? But if we're looking at the content and the context, because the Gemara doesn't say it, because the verse does not say there's a king who died and the king arose, so then what is the verse coming to say when it says there's a new king and that he acted like he was a new king? That he renewed his decrees. What is the Gemara, what is the verse saying then? It's not coming to answer the question as to how Egypt turned coat. Egypt turned coat because they decided to be cut, turn coat. But what does it tell you when it's the same king, but the same king changed his attitude? It tells you how evil he is. If it's a new king, okay, he's a new king. A new king has a new decree and, and he has a new attitude. But the same king turned coat, it tells you how evil he was. That so long as Yosef is alive, he kept his anti-Semitism to himself because he needed this guy. The second doesn't need him anymore. Bam, out comes his evil and he's ready to go. So when you're looking at the literal meaning, the literal meaning is better to say there's a new king and that explains why there's a change in attitude. But if you're looking at the content and you want to talk about how evil Pharaoh is, it's much more evil that he was, that it's the same king. And as soon as Yosef died, anti-Semitism comes out of the, comes out of the, yeah. comes out of his. The literal interpretation gives too much credit right so the literal that's right but the literal interpretation gives us a more literal reading of the verse that a new king new attitude whereas the more content reading of the verse gives us a deeper understanding of the malice of pharaoh yeah and now the same thing because we met there because other examples here i'm not going to go through all of them but because we mentioned yesterday the example of the double cave and we were trying to we were, are trying to remember where the content versus the literal comes in so it goes like this. The literal meaning is Ma'aras Hamachbela, the doubled cave. The doubled cave. So what makes the, the cave doubled? So the Gemara said in Erevin, it's a cave within a cave. But a cave within a cave, the Gemara said that's not enough to refer to it as doubled. Why would it have to be? That's just that's just a regular home that has one room inside of another room, yeah, right? That all, homes are all homes have double doubled homes, right? So what makes it double then? The fact that um, pairs are buried there. Or one was on top Couples, of the other. or one's on top of the other. So if you're going with the literal meaning that it's a cave within a cave, what makes, right, the verse says it's a doubled cave. That means the cave itself is doubled. What makes a cave doubled? Cave inside of a cave is not enough to make it doubled. What makes it doubled? Mara Samachbela, the doubled cave. What makes it doubled is because couples are buried there. That's it. So the literal meaning is the doubled cave is that the cave itself has a doubled nature in that it, it's set to bury couples. That would be the literal meaning. But in the content, it's better to say that it's one building on top of another. Why? Because what's the, what's the content here? What's, what's, what's really happening when Avram is asking for the doubled cave? He's pleading with the people, please give me this cave, I want to buy it. So if he's going to plead with them, he has to make the case, not for why it's a big deal to sell it, but why it's no big deal to sell it. So why would he go and talk about how amazing it is when he's trying to make them sell it? If anything, he should downplay its, its greatness, right? Not go on and say, oh, you know, you know that cave that's capable of burying eight people? I want that one. It's fabulous. It's, fabulous. it's amazing. The seller is supposed to say that, not the buyer. So if you're looking at the content, the context of what, what Avram is doing, it's better that he downplays the cave. So therefore, what is that? What does he say? That what makes it double? It's just a two-story building. Especially since the verse says later, it's the field of Machpelah, which makes it seem like not the cave itself is doubled, but there's something about it refers to as double because there was a two-story building there. So in the context of what Avram is asking for, better downplay the cave. And don't describe it as this place that's amazing where you can have couples. And especially, uh, why would Avram inform them that Adam Machav is born there, buried there? They don't even know that Adam Machav is buried there. Now he's telling them what kind of price possession they're going to rack up the price. He's trying to buy. So he would downplay it. And therefore, in the context, it's better to say that Maris and Machbila just means a two story home. Like this, the Rebbe explains many other Machalikasin from in Medrash and Gemara, which you know, in Shmuel, that's a question of content versus. versus um, the actual literal reading. So, and actually, the Rebbe tells us which one is which. 
And where is it? Yeah, Rav. I think, why does he say Rav is this one Shmuel Tilo? I don't remember. Maybe it just goes in order. Like the first one is the, is the first, in other words, the Gemara quotes Rav and Shmuel and then says what they discuss. And I think everybody just goes that the first one is Rav and the second one is Shmuel. So Rav goes by the words and Shmuel goes by the content. Just going by order. Then. The order, Rav Shmuel, and then who comes next? I think that's what it is. But in the footnote, they're actually, in the footnote here, I see they were connected to other disputes where we do know which one said what and their attitude and learning in general. But it doesn't seem like Abraham was very- Yeah, there were quotes of Gemara where Rabbi will have a discussion on what the proper way of learning is and never derives from there, which one's on the literal and which one's on the content. There's actually a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a shliach by rabbi in Canada. I think he's in Vancouver. He's made it his mission to take, so I mentioned yesterday that the Rebbe does this for, the Rebbe does it with Rav and Shmuel, that Rav is content, Rav is word, literal meaning of the word, and Shmuel is content. The Rebbe does it with Hillel and Shammai. The Rebbe gives a, like an underlying discussion on what Hillel and Shammai are always disputing and explains tens of disputes between Hillel and Shammai all related to this one question of potential versus actual, if you remember, want to know. And the same thing with Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Huda. And whenever they dispute, it comes down to one question. Maybe there's even more that does this too. Rebbe does it also with Babylon and Yerushalmi, like the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. There's always a shared common theme to their disputes. So there's a shliach in Vancouver, I believe. I, 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 I only once spoken to him, but I know him from his, from his published works where he made it his mission to find all the disputes of Rav and Shmuel and Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Huda that the Rebbe doesn't discuss and explain them based on the Rebbe's same premise. So kind of extending the Rebbe's work. In other words, Rebbe explained a certain amount of dispute between Rav and Shmuel, let's say, and he'll find other ones and then explain it back to the same content. And the same thing, with, which is quite an interesting... Uh, exactly. So in other words, if the Rebbe set a premise for what the dispute between Rav and Shmuel is, and they've only discussed four or five of them, go through the other 15, 20 and see if you can make it work with this too, which is an interesting kind of exercise. Anyway, what were we going to say? I was going to say that um, it doesn't seem like Abraham's um, method of down plan is that work. He has to say... So that's interesting. Okay, but that may have been a mm. different reason. Mm. Yes, he wanted to pay a full price. He wanted, he wanted to pay a, full, a fair he price. A price but, but, I, but it doesn't mean that he... It, work. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean necessarily that he, well, actually, they were going to give him for free. And he said no. It doesn't, say, it doesn't mean necessarily that he has to go. In other words, I want to pay a fair price. It doesn't mean that I want to be ripped off. Right? I want to pay a fair price. I got fair and square, but I'm not going to necessarily put myself in a position where I'm going to get ripped off or get overpriced. Imagine, anyway. On the light, um, imagine having a wedding and you have to invite Caleb to show my to the wedding. He puts one on one side and the other on the other side. Actually, Hillary and Shabbat themselves were, friends. were fantastic friends. They yeah. were they were partners in their leadership. Yeah, it's their it's little it's little it's things. probably a century later when uh, the house is a, when the houses of Shammai and Hillel were a little bit more the the Talmud Babu talks about dispute that lasted for three years, but the Jerusalem Talmud talks about actual actual uh, you know made it to the streets. The, the dispute between Hillel and Shammai made it to the streets until finally it was settled. Hillel's Hillel's who we follow. But yeah, Shammai was a tough guy. Yeah. So the other the famous stories of Shammai being a tough guy, that explains those stories also that was with a stick. There has a beautiful talk on those stories as well, explaining where Shammai was coming from and why he was doing that. Anyway, not for now. Lots of beautiful things to learn. Getting back to uh um, yeah. Pharaoh and uh, and Yosef. Yeah, we're gonna get to that now. Yeah. Was Pharaoh older than Yosef? Was Pharaoh older than Yosef? I'm going to go with yes. I don't know the answer to that question, but I my, my some some reason my I don't know. Anybody know here? Who's older, Pharaoh or Yosef? Well, I would imagine Yosef was rather young. Was like on the other hand, though, on the other hand, one second. Let's just let's let's think about this way. Yosef, he was 30 when he became viceroy, right? But Yosef, Yosef died at how old? One ten, right? And according to the opinion that says it was the same king, not a new one, that means Pharaoh outlived Yosef. 
which means if he's older than Yosef, he would be a very old king when Yosef died. So maybe Yosef is older to begin with. So if Pharaoh died, I don't know. Good question. If Pharaoh died, hmm? Joseph had enough power to take over by himself. Well, this Pharaoh died after he Yosef died. Was, this is all after Yosef passes away. After Yosef dies already. So the, the Pharaoh, whoever the Pharaoh is, died after Yosef. Okay. Certainly, he certainly died after Yosef. The question is, did he die at that point after Yosef, or did he die much later after Yosef? At that point, he just changed his attitude, right? But whoever's king with Yosef certainly outlives Yosef either way, right? Either way, because the verse says, right, the verse says that after Yosef died, a new king arose in Egypt. Now, either that's literally a new king. Now, if it's a new king and that Pharaoh died, then it still means he outlived Yosef because the switch in powers after Yosef's death. Or if it's the same king and the king just has a new attitude, then certainly he outlived Yosef, right? So either way, the Pharaoh outlived Yosef. The question is just how long after Yosef did he outlive, which would mean if he was older than Yosef, it would put him at a very old age. So I don't know, it's a good question. Who is old Yosef or, or, or Pharaoh? Maybe then it makes more sense to say that Pharaoh was younger. I don't know, good question. They must have multiplied by the- Who? The Jews. They did, absolutely. They That's- How many, a couple of million? Uh, so at that point, they came down as 70 and it's about a hundred or so years later, right? From when the, the famine happens at the beginning of Yosef's reign, right. when he's something like 30 years old, right? And this begins after Yosef dies, which is a, almost 100 years later, almost a century later, or 70, 80 years later. So it's a long time of Jews, as the verse says, procreating at a high rate. So there were a lot of people, which is why the Gemara is about to quote the next verse, where Pharaoh turns to people and says, uh, these guys are getting too powerful. There's a demographic war here going on here, right? We have a similar thing going on in Israel right now, a demographic war. The king down is only 70? Yeah. Like the Torah lists all 70 people, one of which was born in the gates as they're entering Egypt. Mentioned in yesterday's Chumash and Rashi. Yesterday's Chumash were mentioned that Rashi mentioned that in yesterday's Chitas. Yeah? Hmm. But there's, no, Dina was born earlier. It was Yechebed, right? Yechebed is born in the gate. Yeah, because uh, Yosef married Dina's daughter, isn't he? Yosef. He, yeah, something, yeah, something sounds, sounds familiar. Okay, so let's see. So now we know that either there's a new king, literally, That's sorry? Osnat. Osnat, 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 yeah. Osnat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Osnat is Bas Pertifera. She is Yosef's wife. Right, but isn't Osnat's daughter, 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 daughter Isn't Osnat the blood daughter of Yeah, I think so. So what does that do with Dina? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Let's put a pin in that. I don't know. Someone in the commentary knows, watching, please let us know. It'd be interesting to see. I mean, I'm sure the, the answer is quite obvious. You can probably look at the homage there and it would have it. But um, anyway, okay. So the verse just finished. We, we just established that there's a new king and a new attitude, either literally a new king and that king brought a new attitude or the same king maliciously changes his attitude when Yosef dies. And then the next verse reads, the next two verses read as follows. We can look at the next two verses together. If you look at the, um, on the sidebar, okay, um, I don't know if you have it, but you have it there, uh, the, the, the psukum on the side. So in my thing, it's 16 and 18. I don't know what number would be by you for the actual full psukim. It's the other side, right? The, the, the Torah Ura Shalom yeah, in your Gemara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have it? Yeah. Okay, so I don't know, which, which verses would it be? It would be uh, maybe uh, Tezayin and Yudches? Yeah? Okay, so one verse reads, by Yomer al Amoy, Pharaoh turned to his people, and he said, Hine Amun Israel, behold, the nation of the sons of Israel, they're not, they're not the Jewish people yet because they haven't got the Torah. They're just the sons of Israel i.e. the sons of Jacob, right? Rav are great and more intense than us. That's what he says. Then the next verse reads, let's come up with some sort of plan for them. Perhaps they shall increase even more. And it shall be that a war will break out. It's a possibility. The Knights of Kamhu are saying, anyway, these people who are living in our country are going to join our enemies. The and they will fight us. And because there are a much greater number, 
of all of an arts, and we'll have to be expelled from our own land. So this is Pharaoh turning to his people and saying, these guys are a problem. It's a demographic issue. They're, they're, they, don't, they, they live in our country, but they don't have allegiance to our country. This, this, is a, this is what's it called? This is a claim we hear against Jews till this very day. We hear this all the time. Uh, Jews are living in Canada, but they're not really Canadian. And guess what? They are right. We are not really Canadian. We happen to be living in Canada. We're very thankful and grateful that Canada allows us to live as Jews. That's not who we are. We're Jewish people. And Pharaoh senses this. And he says, look, these people live here in our country, but they don't really belong to us. And if there was a war between us and somebody else, there's no saying that they're not going to join our enemies. And because of their huge numbers, they're going to oust us. It's not as if they have allegiance to Egypt. And if Egypt is going to go to war with Canaan or whatever other country is neighboring, that the Jews are going to defend us because they're Canadian, they might join the enemy for all we know. And then what the population of Egypt was at that time? Just the Egyptians. Egyptian, Egyptian population? By uh, archaeological accounts, it seems pretty pretty big. They were the biggest civilization at the time. It was either that or Mesopotamia, the two big the two big civilizations at the time. What did they worry about the three million Jews? Well, in other words, if they feel that they can handle their enemies, an added three million makes it very difficult. I don't know if it was so much the actual population number or the rate at which it was growing. Definitely. It's the rate at which it was growing. That's true. That's right. It's also the rate at which Jewish people were growing. That's they were populating very quickly, but it wasn't so much the Jews they were worried about, but the Jews are going to. In other words, if they see them and their enemies on equal scale, right, every army considers who are our enemies and makes sure we can beef up against them. But now they have to consider not just beefing up against enemies, but beefing up against their own citizens who might join their enemies, yeah. making it worse, especially this enemy that we're not sure that this, this population of our citizenship that we're not sure where their allegiance is. Right. Maybe they're with us, maybe they're against us, we have no idea. And they're, as you're saying, they're growing at a very fast rate. Have a good day. Yeah. So now let's see the Gemara's analysis of these two verses. So the first reads like this. Um, so three lines down, sorry, four lines down from where we left off, from where we did yesterday, the colon. After the colon, there's four lines down, and the verse says, By Yomer, Pare says, Al Amoy to his people, Hine Ambene Israel, behold the children of Israel, as the verse goes on to say, um, they are multiplying and they may join our enemies, they may not be committed. Egyptian citizens. So the verse read, now the Gemara comments and says, Tana, we learned in the Mishnahic age text, who is Pharaoh himself was the first to bring the issue. In other words, it's not as if the people came to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, you got to protect us from this new demographic of people called the sons of Israel. The people didn't complain to Egypt, to, to Pharaoh. They were okay. It was Pharaoh who came to the people and said, guys, get worried about this other demographic. And therefore, says the Gemara, therefore, therefore, when God punished, he was the first one to get punished. And that, the Gemara is going to tell us in a moment uh, where we see that. So who is the Ace of Trila? He began the process of, of oppressing the Jewish people. Dixiv has the verse reads, we just read this verse, by he turns to his people and says, the Jews are a problem, not the people turning to him. Therefore, therefore, he was punished first. Where do we see that he's punished first? Exhibit the verse reads, with respect to, I believe it's Tzvardeya. Yep, with respect to the plague of the frogs, it says that the frogs are going to attack Bacha, you, Pharaoh, Uva Mecha, and your people, Uva Chalavadecha, and your servants. So the frogs first attack you, Pharaoh, and then the people, because you began the process of oppressing the Jews, so the punishment comes to you first, which is an interesting phenomenon that we find today as well. Ordinary citizens, usually, left to their own devices, have no reason to hate other people. It's politicians who need to rally up the people. They go to the people and say, those guys are your enemy, hate them. And that increases their popularity by rallying people behind them. Because I'm going to defend you from this enemy that you didn't even know you had. And that's what's happening here. The people couldn't care. Jews are living happily, living in Goshen, shepherding the sheep. OK, you shepherd your sheep. I'll do my business. Everybody's happy. Yeah, it's like a, you mean political scheming. <laughs> That's what it is. Pharaoh coming to the people and saying, hey, you have an enemy you don't even know about. Come, let's go deal with them. The, the guys were for the people where the population was fine. But he needed to rile them up. That's how politicians stay relevant. Yeah. By, by reminding you who you hate 
and telling you, come, we have to hate those people. So you better vote for me because I'm going to protect you from those people that you didn't even know you cared about. Once I was watching in Shelly, I was like explaining how like the, the, the mob worked in New York. Basically, if you had a shop, it was a successful shop, and they would, you'd have somebody come into your store and they would say, oh, it's a beautiful story how he would be ashamed if anything happened to it. There's a lot of bad guys out there. You need protection. Yeah, that's just, that's, that's just plain old uh, extortion. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about here. Right. What I'm saying is just be weary of when you hear a politi- when you hear a politician talking about, oh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a scare, there's a threat, there's an enemy. Right. You had no idea that you had enemies and all of a sudden the politician is telling you you have enemies. <laughs> like, what's your problem? I don't have any enemies. Leave me alone. Right. Just be weary of that. It's not always the case. There's, there are legitimately people who want to harm you and we right. need you know, people to protect us and so on and so forth. Just keep your antennas up when politicians tell you that there's an enemy out there. Just like Farrow turning to people and saying, oh, there's an enemy, the Jewish people there, they're your enemy. Yeah. The, the people were fine. He told them that there's, that there's an enemy and then they got all riled up. So just uh, keep that in mind. It's just interesting. What if, what if Trudeau would come around and say, there's an enemy there in Canada. They're, they're, they're the Islamic uh, yeah. religion. They're allowed to take over. And if there's a war, who's gonna know where- Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I. You treat these people nice, they'll be with you. Exactly, I, I 100% agree. 100% agree. This could be a war too. 100%. That's why I'm making this comment. That's why I'm making this comment. 100%. I think if it, it, you know, I truly believe this that if, if people watch TV less, there would be less violence in the world. Not even a question. Not even a question. Just, just, you hear TV all day long. This guy's horrible. This one's horrible. This one's horrible. It gets you angry. It gets you, it gets you worked up. Yeah. You know? It's just, just bad because they, they're they all competing for your eyeballs. So they're going to get as bombastic as they can to get your eyeballs. And there's a very simple solution. Don't give them your eyeballs. Yeah. Just turn off. Succumb to the sensationalism. Yeah. Everybody has to outdo yeah. who's a worse enemy. Who's a, who's a scarier threat? What's a scarier threat? Oh, watch me because I have a scarier threat to deal with. Like, just... Yeah. Stop it. Just calm down. Everybody's good. Your neighbors are nice. Be nice to your neighbors. They'll be nice back to you. You know, before you, before you've met somebody, does they, uh, I hate them because in TV I said that these people, why are you doing that? It happened it happened between religious Jews and not religious Jews and between Jews and non-Jews between, it's just a terrible thing. Yeah, hundred percent. Absolutely. hundred percent. The French language, I actually think that Canada is much better than the U.S. One of the one of the things that, to me, I've been, especially since I moved back here, that I've been seeing, what I've what I've been finding that I actually like about Canada, and I'm hoping we don't lose that quality, is the fact that people don't care about politics here. Yeah. Even if I don't, even if I disagree with people's politics, I don't. I have, I have my own political views, just like everybody else knows that's political views. Yeah. But I'm so much happier to be in a place where no one cares about politics. Which is why when they voted Trudeau in a second time, this is Mumsha tangent, but not that I like everything Trudeau does, but I was very happy vote, they voted him again. You know why? Because these people are happy. <laughs> and a happy population is a good population. They're not going to start rioting in the streets because they're happy. So they voted in the same guy again because they don't care. And it's perfect. Perfect. You have to have everybody getting all politically charged and this one's marching on the street from this one. Just yeah. stop it. Focus on your life, feed your family, take care of your neighbors, learn Torah, serve Hashem, and forget about it, but all, all the politics. Leave it out. You don't need this. You don't need Pharaoh coming to you telling you, oh, there's an enemy. You yeah. don't need that. It's one of the beauties of yeah, healthy debate and, and standing up for what you believe. I'm not okay. saying I'm not talking about, I'm not negating, God forbid, the necessity for politics. Trust me, I understand the necessity yeah. of politics. And I have very, very strong political views, but I think that it's it's much more valuable have a population that doesn't have any political views and having a, you know, it talks about a robust political debate. I'm not so convinced I want a robust political debate. Yeah. I'm not so convinced. My grandfather told me that his father told him his father came from Poland before World War II. He saw the writing on the wall, there's gonna be but there's anti-Semitism and he's like, I'm out. He left Poland in 1921, came to Australia. So my grandfather who was 94, 95, was born in Australia. So because his father came, to, his father told him, when you're on the train going to work and you see all the Australians looking at the back page of the newspaper, you should know everything's fine. Because the back page is a sports section. Yeah. When they're reading the sports section, everything is fine. When you see all of them reading the front page, they're reading politics, start to get nervous. Uh, it's a very, very true. Yeah. When everybody's worked up about politics and you have idiot pharaohs telling you, this one's your enemy, that one's your enemy, now start to get nervous because it doesn't matter which side they're going to be on. 
somehow the Jew is going to become their enemy. So you'd much rather a population that's looking at the sports section and feeding their family and doesn't care so much about politics. Much, 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 much better population, which is what makes Canada such a beautiful country. And I hope it stays this way. I hope we don't lose it. And that's it. You know. Anyway, sidebar, but I think it's related to this Gemara, where the whole thing starts because some idiot politician named Pharaoh decides to, to, to create an enemy. The population was fine, and he comes to the population and says, oh, they're your enemy, and all of a sudden we're enslaved. Okay. Yeah. But, oh, but this comes back to the measure for measure, which is why it comes up in the Gemara here, right? The whole context here is measure for measure, and now it's measure for measure again. Pharaoh started the, pro started the problem, so he got punished first. Yeah. The Egyptians got punished forever. Yeah, they did. If you, would, if you would see what Cairo looks like today and all the other cities, you'd say, oh my God. Hmm. Pharaoh had, well, look, Egypt, like many civilizations, had ups and downs. They had beautiful times and they had bad times. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Maimonides lived there, he, he, he was the only safe place he can go to. Yeah. And Egypt was doing very well, even though he acknowledged that he was violating the Torah's command by living in Egypt, because Torah said not to move back to Egypt, but he had no choice. He tried everywhere else and he was thrown out. He was thrown out of Spain and thrown out of Morocco and then thrown out of Israel. So he had no choice to live in, but to live in Israel. To live in Egypt, but it seems that there was a very thriving big Jewish community then he, he was there. Alexandria has one of the oldest shoals in the world. Yeah. Today, there's like enough seven Jews left there. Cairo Geniza is huge. Cairo, ben Alexandria, we yeah, the Ben Ezra Shul, yeah. We sure. So, and, and these are, you know, post the Jews, obviously post Exodus. So they had their ups and their downs, but, uh, the but there's a prohibition against settling Egypt, yeah. Yeah, none, and nonetheless. Yeah. I think, what it would be like to my My father's, my father's mother is from Alexandria. And, uh, really? Yeah, this is crazy. Oh, you told me that already. Yeah, your father was familiar. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, there was a thriving Jewish community until what is it? Till 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 the, till forty eight, and then sixty seven was even worse. More Jews left. Yeah. Basically. Now they had a homeland. You know, they they could. Not just that, because their neighbors started to hate them. Oh. Because once the Israel moved in, then a lot of uh, anti semitism arrived in in the Arab lands, and that's another part of history. But the, the Jews did very very well in the Muslim lands. Relatively speaking, did much better than their counterparts in Ashkenaz land under right. the Christians until the independence of the before, state created. Before that, already, once Jews started populating the states, like for right. example, 1929, there was a massacre in Hebron. Right. But before that, Jews were living peacefully with their Arab neighbors. And then 1929, their same Arab neighbors who were their friends came to murder them. Well, they were living in the Arab land with their Arab neighbors. They were living in Hebron. Oh, really? There's no. Right. Chabad Hasidim have been living in Israel since the first generation of Chabad, right. since the 1700s. Right. Living peacefully and happily with their Arab neighbors right. until till the twenties, hmm. till Zionism became became a thing. Whatever, it's another part of history. But yeah, it, 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 that that caused the um, it stoked the anti-Semitism yeah, within so within the uh, Middle East, which led to the eventual expulsion of Jews from most of the Arab lands: Yemen, Egypt, hmm. Iraq, Lebanon, where Jews lived for hundreds of years. Jordan, yeah, and the Jordan, Jordan, I think also. But certainly, uh, Iran, yeah. uh, Lebanon, uh, Lebanon uh, Egypt, Iraq, uh, Yemen, all these countries, Tunisia, yeah. all these countries had massive numbers of Jews yeah. until, until basically 48. Wow. Or until earlier. It started really early, but 48 and then 67 was definitely the uh, last straw for these people. And they didn't all leave the Arab lands to go to, to move to Israel? Well, why would they? Yeah. You, you didn't leave Canada to move to Israel. You have a nice life here, right? <laughs> So yeah. the same thing to the people living in Egypt. I've been here for centuries. I have a family business. We have real estate here. We have a beautiful show. Why am I moving anywhere? Right. And so they had to leave because of the because of the violence, right. because of the anti-Semitism. Yeah, because anyway. I know you're saying yeah, in a sense it's not like there's a common pursuit that like since the state of Israel got its independence, that's when Israel started. Like, hello, Israel's been the land of Israel since since the beginning of time. Since the since the Jews, since Joshua walked in there, 100. percent Right. Yeah, it's, so it's the biggest. Now all of a sudden, it's a Kiddush that it's that it's. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to go there, but no, but it's a little bit offensive to say that Israel's seventy-one years old. Excuse me. No, of course. It's three and a half thousand years old. What, 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 what kind of seventy years old is this? Right. It's it's offensive to the thousands of Jews who lived for hundred generations. You know that Israel had a Jewish population uninterruptedly since Joshua walked in there, even when we were expelled from the land. 
after the second destruction, second temple. There were still Jews living there. Right. And there was never a period of time when Jews did not live in Israel, uninterruptedly. Right. Whether they were being oppressed by, by the Crusaders or by the, by the Ottomans, whoever it was, there's uninterruptedly settlements of Jews living in Israel. It's not as if like Israel was, you know, you know, full of just this country called Palestine. And then in 1948, just massive Jews just rolled in. It, Jews were living there for centuries. Right. Happily with their Arab neighbors. But, the, yeah. but anyway, that's just another point. Okay, we're gonna start with yeah. Okay. No, so the 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 identity of it becoming so what changed and now now is like recognized by the UN that it's officially yeah. we're not gonna go there right now. Okay. Okay, well, we're gonna continue God willing Mr. Shem on Monday. Yeah. One, oh, one second, no one second. Um, Sunday yeah. is Sunday is no there's no class. Monday and Tuesday is we're gonna pick up on Wednesday, God willing. Yeah. So Chabad we wish each other. Before Shavuos, Kabbalah Tatayr Basimcha Bapnimis, we should receive the Torah joyfully and internally. Simcha Bapnimis. So the, every word in this is precise. Receive the Torah because the Torah is being given to you anyway. The, the holiday is called Matan Torah, the time of the giving of the Torah. So God gives. What do we have to do? We have to receive. But receive how? Got to re- if I'm going to receive it, it's got to become really mine. Now, if it becomes really mine, number one, I have to be happy about it. If I'm not happy about it, then it's not truly mine. There's a part of me that doesn't want it. So you've got to be kabbal satayr, receive the Torah. But how do you receive the Torah? Besimcha, joyfully. Because if you're not happy about it, then there's a part of me that, that rejects it. And now if it's besimcha, if it's happily, then it's pepimius, I'll internalize it. I'm happy about the Torah, and therefore I internalize this message. So this wish is not a wish for what God does. God's doing it anyway. God's giving the Torah. It's a wish for our response that we should be able to internalize it happily and joyfully so that it permeates who we are. And then in turn, when we receive it in the Torah happily, the Torah will then make us happy. As the Pasuk is, the mitzvahs of Hashem are good and they bring joy to the heart. And we indeed, we indeed experience that all of us who put effort into serving Hashem know exactly what this means when it says that serving Hashem brings the greatest joy. All right. Have a wonderful day, a good Nair Shabbos, and a good Yom Tif.